Hi, this is Jay Geary, and I'm with Alstom Grid in Red Redmond, Washington. I'm going to be talking to you about operating the electric power grid. More specifically, I'm going to be talking to you about the energy management system, which is the brain and nerve center of an electric power company. So this is one module of three, and it will focus on the EMS. The learning objectives this module, you will be able to name the three major outcomes of the New York City blackout of 1965. You will be able to list the major challenges of operating the power grid. You will be able to list the three major EMS functional areas. And you will also be able to say why today's grid is already smart. In the 60s, managing the power grid was much more antiquated than it is today. It consisted of analog hardwired systems with an operator in the loop and the operator monitored dials and strip charts and made changes to generators using thumb wheel screws. So our story begins in New York City, November 9th, 1965. And it was the night when the lights went out. The blackout statistics, it started during the rush hour, lasted over 14 hours, affected 25 million people, 80,000 square miles, and billions of dollars in business were lost. Made the headlines and the cover of Time magazine. Now some of the outcomes of the big blackout were that the pu public were awakened to our dependence on electricity. You could not take it for granted anymore. Universities are re-energized in power programs. New government R&D funds became available for power systems research to prevent future such blackouts. And also concurrently, we had the advent of the affordable digital computer. So what this meant is that large, complex mathematical problems, such as power system analysis, became easier to solve. Two new national initiatives were launched after the blackout. One was NERC, and the other was EPRI, and these two still exist today. And so thanks to the timely and fortunate nexus of three events, greater R&D funding for power systems, more students in electric power engineering, and the birth of affordable digital computers, we had the advent of the modern EMS. And this is the topic of today's presentation. Okay, quick overview of the electricity grid in two dimensions. It's a vast supply chain. It starts with a generating station which produces electricity. It could be a fossil plant, meaning it could be a coal-fired plant or a natural gas plant, or it could be a hydro plant or a nuclear plant. But the end result is it produces electricity and typically it produces electricity at a lower voltage and what we do first in order to transmit it to long distances to customers is to step up the voltage of the electricity. So we step it up to 500 kV or up to 138 kV and then transmit the electricity across long distances to get to the end user. Now the reason we do step up the voltage is in order to reduce losses when we transmit electricity. Because physics states that uh, the losses are a function of the current squared. So by raising voltage, you can transmit the same amount of power at a much lower current. So by lowering the current, you're lowering the losses. So once you get to the eventual customer site, 
you have a step down transformer to lower the voltage to the desired voltage level that a customer requires. Some customers may want the voltage at 26 kV or 69 kV. Some customers may want it at 13 kV or 4 kV. And you and me in residences want the voltage at 120 volts or 240 volts. So essentially, so this is the vast supply chain which constitutes the electricity grid. The blue denotes the transmission system, which is the focus of our attention in this presentation. The green is distribution and the black is generation. So this is a quick overview of the North American power grid by the numbers. The North American grid consists of three interconnections, the Eastern interconnection, the Western interconnection, and Texas. And it consists of over 3,000 electric utilities, various stakeholders, millions of customers, and millions of transmission and distribution lines. Now, in 2000, the U.S. National Academy of Engineers decided to take a vote to determine what they thought was the greatest engineering achievement of the past 20th century. Now, the National Academy of Engineers is a very prestigious group of comprises of chemical engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical, and civil, and they're just a fraction of the total engineers in North America. The selection process to get in there is very difficult. So they took a vote amongst themselves and came up with the top 20 greatest engineering achievements of the past century. And this is the list of the top 20. So they voted electrification or supplying power from a generating plant to the customer as the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. So this is the topic of our presentation today. We are going to be talking about how to manage the whole process of electrification to ensure that we supply power around the clock to customers as and when they need it. So this is another overview of the power grid, the high voltage of the transmission grid, and the low voltage in the grayed out area is the distribution system. We're going to be focusing on the transmission grid and how to maintain reliability and efficiency of the transmission grid. Now the challenge we face is that electricity demand changes second by second. Each time a user switches a light switch on or off, demand changes. So you can imagine if you had millions of customers switching lights or appliances on or off, it changes electricity demand instantaneously. The other issue we have is electricity as a commodity cannot be stored easily. If we could economically and efficiently store electricity, it would make managing the grid and ensuring 7 by 24 electricity to all customers much simpler. So supply needs to react instantaneously to meet demand since storage is not an easy option. If supply does not meet demand, then protective relay strip leading to a potential cascading blackout. Now these are some of the major sources of grid vulnerability. We have natural calamities such as Hurricane Katrina or Superstorm Sandy which wipes out portions of the grid and weakens the grid making it more difficult to supply power to customers. We have line overloads which result in sagging into trees which causes them to be tripped out equipment and protection failures, 
Most of the equipment and relays in North America are over 50 years old. So what that means is that they're prone to failure. They're getting older. Breaks in communication links, faults. You could have a lightning strike on a transmission line which causes the line to go out and be tripped out. Human errors. Many of the blackouts could be traced to a human making the wrong decision. So we can provide all the software tools and hardware tools for the human operator, but they need to be trained to use them properly. So training is a vital part of ensuring grid reliability, training of operators. Inadequate security margin. If we try to maximize the utilization of the transmission grid, and if we operate closer to the limits, then there is a possibility of a potential vulnerability. Gaming in the market, I mean, as we had electricity as a market introduced, we saw what happened with Enron trying to buy and sell power, and what that created was a problem, and uh, the grid reliability was compromised. Sabotage, whether we like it or not, we have entities across the globe who are trying to hack into our software systems in the U.S. And what this means is that if they try to get into the EMS software, they potentially have the ability to trip a circuit breaker or compromise the grid. Missing or uncertain information. A lot of our decision making is based on measurements we get from the field and sometimes if they come in incorrectly or they are late, we potentially can make the wrong decision. Now some of the challenges of grid management is that assessing the current state of the grid is computationally intensive. It's not easy to do that. It needs to be continually updated because conditions on the grid are changing continually. Measurements are noisy. There's certain uncertainty of operating conditions because the measurements we get from the grid may be old or incorrect. And we base our experience on past real life experience. So we base our decision making based on what we've learned on the job in the past. So we need to try to provide better training of critical conditions ahead of time so that operators can be better prepared rather than having to learn everything on the job. So the reality we face is blackouts will occur again in the future. Our power grid is way too complex to make it fail safe. Now this is a timeline of high impact blackouts worldwide. We start off with the November 9th 65 blackout in the northeast US and in 2012 we had two consecutive days of blackouts in India which affected hundreds of millions of people. So blackouts will continue and it's a question of how do we deal with them and how do we try to minimize their impact on the eventual customer. So the solution we seek is how to contain an initiating event to prevent a cascading uncontrolled spread across the grid. And more importantly, how to restore power to customers quickly. So you and I know that if we lose power for say 15 minutes, we can tolerate that. It's something which will not bother us too much. You may have to reset the clocks and stuff like that. But if we lose power for an hour or a couple of hours, then it becomes an annoyance because we have to deal with a blackout, especially if it happens at night or when we're cooking. Or It's an inconvenience. Now, if we have a blackout which lasts a day or more, then it definitely is not something that we would like. So if we can restore power quickly to customers, that definitely 
will help. So the heart of grid operations is the energy management system, or the EMS. And the EMS has been evolving over the past 50 years, as I mentioned. It started in the 60s. And the objective of the EMS is to manage the physical flow of electricity or to operate the electric grid within safe limits at all times, to prevent blackouts, to automatically adjust generation to demand, identify risks and take preventive action, and as I said, expedite restoration. Now this is a picture which was put together in 1978, originally started with Tom Deliaco of Cleveland Electric, and then Les Fink and Ken Carlson added a few more sort of states to this. Essentially it says that the power system grid is in one of many different states. The normal state is when demand is met and the constraints are met, meaning that all the equipment is operating safely within limits. So if we say E, that means demand is met, and if we satisfy I, that means the constraints are met. So the power grid operates for 99% or more of its time in the normal state, meaning demand is met and the constraints are being met. Now the alert state, which is in yellow, denotes the fact that if a contingency were to occur, we have the possibility of violating some constraints. So this is considered an insecure state with the potential for violating a constraint. Now if for some reason a line gets overloaded or a generator is operating above its limit, that means the constraint is not being met. That is considered to be in the red below the emergency state where demand is being met, but certain equipment in the grid is overloaded or operating beyond its limits. So that's considered an emergency state, and that means we have to take some corrective action. So the corrective action is to try to bring it back to the alert state, and then from the alert state back to the normal state, if we can, as quickly as possible. Now, if for some reason demand is not met and constraints are not being met, we deem that to be in the in extremist state, which is the bottom left. That means we have to drop load, cut customers off, and look for ways of alleviating the overloads on the grid. So the goal when we're in the in extremist state is to bring it back to the restorative state, meaning where constraints are being met, but we're still not satisfying all the customers, meaning the demand is not being met. So from the restorative state, the intent is to bring it back to the normal state as quickly as possible. So the EMS and the EMS operator's objective is to try to ensure that the grid operates in the normal state where demand is met and constraints are being met in order to keep the lights on. So the focus here is on the steady state grid operation, meaning following the slow behavior of the electricity in the grid. So this is again a quick recap. In the 60s and 70s, we had analog hardwired equipment. And what the operator was monitoring was generators and tie lines in the grid. And the basic functions were SCADA, and load frequency control. SCADA stands for supervisory control and the data acquisition. And the intent of the operator was to try to maintain system frequency or the generation load balance. In the 80s and 90s, with the advent of the digital computer, we have a lot more software applications that were developed we have generation applications, transmission applications, and the training simulator. 
and we have operator consoles through which operators interacted with these different applications. And now we were monitoring the power system, high voltage substations, in addition to the generators and the tie lines. So this is what a modern EMS control center looks like from the operator's perspective. You have multiple operators looking at the same grid. On the left, you could have the generation operator monitoring the generators. In the middle, you could have the transmission system operator who's monitoring the transmission lines and switching. On the right, you could have a interchange scheduling operator who's making decisions of buying and selling power with neighbors in order to lower costs. And in the middle, you have a supervisor who is coordinating all the different operators to try to ensure that we can supply power to customers reliably. So what if we brought back Edison, who was the inventor of electricity, if you will, and Bell, who invented the, elect the phone? What if we brought them back a hundred years later? If Bell saw a modern phone, would he recognize it? Probably not. But if Edison came back, he would probably recognize the vestiges of the old control center in today's EMS. So today's control centers focus on reliability, economics, and efficiency. Control centers manage the flow of energy in the grid. The EMS manages the physical flow of the high voltage transmission system. The DMS or the distribution management system manages the physical flow of the lower voltage distribution system. And the market management system manages the financial flow amongst electricity market participants. So we're focusing primarily in this module on the EMS. So the control center's goal is to balance reliability and economics. But reliability always trumps economics. So these are the three main EMS application areas. SCADA, a supervisory control and data acquisition. Generation scheduling and dispatch and transmission grid management. Now generation scheduling and dispatch includes an application called AGC or real-time automatic generation control. In many ways this is one of the first smart grid applications that were introduced to ensure grid reliability. It is software which automatically issues controls to generators in order to maintain the generation load imbalance second by second. So this is another view of the EMS analysis tools. At the bottom we have SCADA, which receives data from the grid every two to four seconds. And we think of SCADA as the eyes of the EMS, meaning that if you did not have SCADA, you would not have any visibility into what's happening on the grid. It is the primary application which interacts with the real power system. Then we have AGC, which is in many ways thought of as a reactive brain. It sees what SCADA is providing and reacts to ensure that generation load imbalance is main maintained or generation load balance is maintained. Then we have state estimate and contingency analysis, which is the analytical brain. And that looks at the grid as a mathematical problem and tries to fill in the gaps to say this is what is happening in areas of the grid which are not being measured. Then we have the proactive brain, which is the training simulator which looks ahead to identify what's coming up in the future in order to make decisions now to avoid any problems in the immediate future. Then on the left we have the market system tools which is what we think of as the fiscal brain which means how can I use the market rules to maximize profitability. 
Now another way of looking at the grid is again from the EMS subsystems. SCADA looks at it as an asynchronous uncorrelated telemetry view. AGC looks at it from the energy balance or the system frequency view by looking at generation and tie lines. State estimator and contingency analysis look at a system-wide correlated view and the training simulator or DTS looks at the future system-wide view. So today's grid includes smart automated capabilities already. We have system-wide smarts, and these include the EMS with operator actions. We have the EMS with automatic generation control. We also have schemes for load shedding, either under or over voltage load shedding, or under or over frequency load shedding. Also, some power companies have special grid protection schemes called RAS or Remedial Action Schemes or SIPs, System Integrity Protection Schemes, which are basically heuristically developed schemes which identify conditions on the grid and take corrective action based on past experience and offline studies. So you can think of them as a protective relay for the grid which is built offline. Then for regions of the grid we have regional smarts. For a particular region we may want to have voltage var control which ensures that the voltage profile in that region is kept flat, meaning you don't have too many low voltages or too many high voltages. In addition you may also have under and over voltage load shedding schemes in a particular region based on adverse voltage conditions. And finally, once we get down to the equipment level, we have equipment smarts. We have relays for protection of individual power equipment, for isolation of transformers, lines and generators, if a fault is detected in them. And this is very important because equipment such as transformers, lines and generators are very expensive. And if a fault were to occur, it could essentially wipe out or make the equipment unusable for the future. And in order to protect them, we have equipment relays which quickly identify a fault and trip them offline so that they're saved from being completely demolished. So in conclusion, this is what a control center looks like today and we want to remind ourselves that the power grid is one of the most complex and immense engineering machines in existence today. It's a 7 by 24 must run machine in order to ensure that electricity is supplied to the customer around the clock. Secondly, today's grid is already smart. That's something we need to remember. And finally, our challenge is to make tomorrow's grid even smarter. So this concludes module one and in module two, we will talk about what is the smart grid and how can we make it even smarter than it is today. Thank you.